everyone. This is Inner Whispers Radio and Blogcast, episode number five. My name is Alan. I'm the host. And this show, as all shows, will feature April Crawford, who's a full-body, open, deep trance channel, a best-selling author with 10 books in print on Amazon. But here's a top secret thing. There are another couple of books that are only available on Kindle. They're completely different. You might want to check them out. The show also will feature, of course, Veronica, our name for a causal plane entity uh, who has talked to really thousands of people, held over 10,000 readings, and uh, she's going to speak on a variety of subjects. She has no idea what I'm going to ask, and I have no idea what April or Veronica are going to say. So right now, I'm going to hand the phone to April, and then we'll talk to Veronica. Hi, everyone. It's April. Again, I'm enjoying this every week where I get the chance to talk a little bit. And I think it's important for me to state how I feel as being a full body trans channel. I came into this life to find a goal of acceptance, which is pretty funny when you think about it, you know, being a full body trans channel sometimes isn't all that acceptable to a lot of the mainstream people. And I have learned over the last 25 years that all I really need to do is accept myself. And what I'm doing is of good energy and allowing energies to come through me. I've never had a bad experience. And I think that's because I learned to accept myself and I've learned to feel that what I was doing is a good thing. Now, there's a lot of people, you know, who are deeply religious or deeply fearful about this process. But I do know that through some research I've done myself, that this is something that has gone on for eons. And sometimes churches or sometimes religious communities frown upon it because they wanted to control people and not have other things go on that you know, could deviate from what they had laid down as the law. Every day I wake up and I feel blessed to have the ability to do this. I find that I have physical things that, you know, like anybody else, a sore throat or I get an earache or I do something to myself that I hurt myself, that when I channel, somehow when I get back from the experience, a lot of the things I'm feeling that were not good when I went out are gone. So I know deeply with inside myself that what I'm doing is an okay thing to do. And I want to encourage anyone who is sort of on the path of looking into this to understand that there's nothing to fear. And all you have to do is just be really focused internally and connected with your own guides and your own energy. And it turns out to be a pretty good experience. So my goal of acceptance, I think I sort of finished it off in this lifetime because I now accept myself fully. I can't care what others' opinions are because I'm the only one really having the experience. But I want to encourage all of you who have the desire to reach into a spiritual realm and connect with it in perhaps not a traditional way um, to do so because there's nothing to fear there. We th- I think that a lot of the evil stuff that people talk about is man-made, not spiritually made. Again, I just want to say I'm really glad I get a chance to talk, and I think every week I'm going to just talk a little bit about my experience and my perspective about the channeling, because I know there's a lot of you out there that would like to do the same thing. So, we're having a good day, and I'm here, and... I'm going to give the phone back to Alan so he can uh, chat with you. Okay. That was uh, April, and Veronica will be in momentarily. It doesn't usually take much time since she knows about these uh, radio interviews. I'm tempted to give a countdown just for the fun of it, but she'll be here before I get to to one. Okay, Veronica is (laughs) here. What a surprise. So, First thing I wanted to ask you, Veronica, is about two separate concepts, but I think one of the most dominant ones 
on this planet and the, the one of the ones that interferes with people manifesting what they want it probably has you know maybe even have influence in between lives i'm not sure and that is fear so you can you talk about the pros and cons of fear and like no fear Good day to all of you. We are Veronica, and we have just been asked a question by the Alan Crawford about fear. Fear is an element where you really separate from your soulful expression. It is an isolating place, and it can wreak havoc upon anyone's movement, either in physical or non-physical. We'd say having no fear is greatly important because with fear there can be created images that have nothing to do with what the truth is. So we would say that on an energetic level, if you find yourself sliding into a fearful moment, stop for one second and say, do I really need to go in this direction? And really, what is there to be afraid of? We would say that the, you continue No matter what calamity occurs, what disaster occurs, you will continue with or without your biological form, but you will continue. So that sort of eliminates the probabilities of termination because you will continue no matter what. So we would say decide every day that you're not going to be afraid of anything. And when something rises up where okay, usually you're so I'm really afraid of this, turn around and look it square in the eye and say, you know what? I don't need to be afraid of this. Why why am I afraid of this? And then analyze it, think about it, and come to the conclusion that you don't need to be fearful. If everyone on the planet decided not to be in a fearful state, to say, I fear nothing, the threat of fear, which some people like to perpetuate, becomes null and void. So decide every day that no matter what, you are not fearful. And if you do find things that do sort of trigger that and you take a good look at them and see what you can do to remedy the fearful moment because you are a much more powerful being by not adhering to any sort of fear. Okay, Veronica, a few follow-up questions. This is my way. And that is, Thought creates reality. People individually, literally create their own reality, and especially they get together with groups. I mean, we've all agreed that gravity exists and stuff like that when we came to this planet. So the question is, being fearful, are you drawing lines to events that will help you fulfill that fear? Um I understand fight or flight fear, which I accept as reasonable, but if you're afraid of things and thinking about that all the time, is there a pretty good chance that you're going to attract events to fulfill that fear? Yes. We think it's very important to check your thought process at any given time during your day. And if you are fearful of something, it it is important to take a look at it and determine why you are fearful. Because if you say, okay, well, I'm afraid of this, and then something sort of manifests itself that's close to that, you're drawing a e-line straight to it with your thoughts of being fearful about it. So that is why we said even before that it's important that you are fearful of nothing. Because if you're not fearful then you will not draw the line in the sand towards the fearful moment. Now, you live in a collective. There's a lot of individual energy upon the planet. And you can't control anybody else's thought process, but you can control your own. And you can decide and take a good look at, okay, I'm thinking fearfully, and boy, did I attract that to myself because I was afraid of it. Perhaps if I'm not afraid of it, and I say, I don't allow this into my reality, then what you fear the most will not materialize. It is a fact that that can happen. So we'd say that every one of you needs to be very, very clear in how you think. And if you do find yourself fearful of something, examine it. 
take a look at it and say, what can I do to remedy this? And what if I decide I'm not afraid that I'm going to look right square in the eye and stare it down and create a different reality and not allow yourself to slide into a collective fearful moment? Okay, uh, Veronica, and uh, one final question on fear, and that is, now that you're hanging out in the causal plane, do you fear anything? We fear nothing. There is nothing that could jar our energy into a unsettled moment. But of course, we're not on the linear plane, which where most fear is generated from. But we have been there. And we realize how fear can affect all of you. And it affected us in certain lifetimes and frames of time. So where we're at, we can look at all of the experiences we've had. And we will agree that fear is generated primarily in the linear. And that's where you're all residing. So we want to encourage all of you to start a campaign within yourself to not be fearful because that will only draw the event towards you. And we think if you decide you're not afraid, it will push back and I might be there, but it's not going to affect you. As you progress in your evolution, your consciousness learns that it's not necessary to be afraid and that it is a condition that doesn't lend itself to the expansion of your awareness. So no, we are never afraid. Okay, the next uh, concept I'd like to throw out there, which is I consider um, material but not nearly as effective as fear, is purpose of guilt. Um, and I'm not just talking about the jokes that go around where you know mother-in-laws and mothers use guilt to manipulate their children and in-laws. I'm talking about someone who's like 15 years old. They have guilt, maybe... Uh, you know, they let their sister drown or something, and they live with it, and they're 40, 50, 60 years old, and they can't let go of the guilt. So my question is, from a spiritual point of view, what is the point of guilt? Should you let it go? Should you just harbor it, wait until your next life? What about guilt? There are dramatic events that unfold in the linear, where sometimes there is an unfortunate event. And... One, the person who survives usually is the one who feels guilt for just being alive. Let's say it was a car accident and you were driving and you caused the accident and all the passengers in the car moved on to another realm because their bodies were compromised and you are the one left to constantly relive that moment over and over. Because in a linear sensing, you cut short their participation in the linear. But in that kind of instance, and we're using this as an example, you have to also consider that the energies that crossed over entered into that, say, car accident with you with the notion that there was a probability they would leave us stay. And yes, the life was cut short, their energy continues and they will have other opportunities to participate in linear dramatics. Harboring the guilt for such an event does not allow you to keep, to keep expanding your consciousness. Sometimes it sort of stagnates the progress of your energy by not understanding that there's a bigger picture involved. We'd say harboring guilt is something that is man-made. It is something that can be alleviated. And we think if you look at the bigger picture and what went on, say, like in this car accident that we're using as an example, that everybody enters into a dramatic event for a reason. And perhaps the people that did get killed in the car accident when you were driving agreed to having that participation, knowing that they continue and having a belief system based on that is the best way to go with it. And there, there are many different levels of guilt. I mean, it's not just a car accident where you're with a driver. 
you have to some point at some point decide am i really advancing myself or am i stagnating myself by being so guilty um it is a condition of the culture and a linear culture to propagate guilt when somebody does something wrong or something happens and you feel like you were the root of the problem releasing the guilt and accepting the eternal perspective of it is probably the best way to go. You will always remember what happened, and you will always look at it with a bit of sadness. Letting go of the guilt, those who have crossed would want you to, because they have continued. Yes, that life was cut short, and then a lot of people were affected, but you have to, at some point, look at the bigger picture and know that everything continues whether you think so or not. Okay, Veronica. Now I have a question that somebody wrote in on uh, the comments section, which I encourage everybody to do. And that is, uh, it's a little less heady than this, but it's something that I personally experienced and personally asked you about. And that is, what about killing a pest like a rat or a swarm of ants, or in my case, rattlesnakes? Um, When I've had to kill rats in my last residence, there were Norwegian roof rats, and there were hundreds of them, and I felt terrible about killing them on two levels. One is I didn't want to kill an animal, and but two, you know, you got birds of prey that could eat those rats and die. Um, in our new place here in Southern California, I've had to kill a couple of rattlesnakes, and one of those rattlesnakes was within five inches of my face before I saw it, and he was coiled and ready to strike. And I don't do it to protect me, frankly. I do it because... My pets don't know what rattlesnakes are. My pets don't know what black widows are. And I also have to protect April, obviously. So what about, and this kind of ties into guilt, what about killing these threats, even though they're animals? There is a collective of consciousness that manifests itself as, we'll say, um, like rats, Um, snakes, um, indigenous to a land mass kind of thing that are of a collective thought process. You do have to protect those who do not understand the threat of, say, a rattlesnake. And rats have been known to bring in disease and difficulty for eons. When you take them, out of their element. Sometimes you have to to protect your own element. What happens is that they return to the collective and regenerate and come back again. So what you're doing is mainly doing a maintenance removal because it's not like they are killed and it's over with and they don't have any other opportunity to exist. Rattlesnakes are the same way. They are part of a collective consciousness that will regenerate itself. And we do think on a higher level, both of these creatures that you have mentioned have an understanding that they are acting naturally within their environment. And sometimes humans move into their natural environment to build homes and things, and they feel threatened by it. So they are reacting. They don't feel that they are acting out in an aggressive way. They're just trying to protect their environment as well in the only way they know how to do it. But there is a collective force that animals like that will return to that collective and to recognize and take into yourself is that there is a collective of energy, especially for animals that are, we don't want to say lesser evolved because most animals are more evolved than humans, but there are some that are participating in a reactive kind of way and to know that they return to the collective. Now, in any situation where you have the choice, whether to relocate or take them out, you should probably try to do the relocation. But if you have a rattlesnake a few inches from your face, probably you, you, know, you would react and say, okay, i got to protect myself. They will return to the collective and they'll be okay. They understand this. So don't feel guilty and horrible about it because you are mainly trying to protect your dogs, your cats, yourselves from annihilation. 
Okay, thank you, Veronica. Now let's segue to something else, and that is we have two, or maybe two or three, a lot of different groups of people who call the Veronica for consultations. And I would say by far and away, most individuals uh, are interested in their own personal growth or their family issues or maybe marriage issues, whatever. But the, the ones who have the most frequent um, sessions are business people, and that is, you know, professional service providers. I'm talking about doctors, medical doctors, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and energy workers who call quite frequently, sometimes every week, sometimes multiple times per week. And it's they're not just talking about themselves. They are calling to get information that will help them give better sessions and better uh, service to their patients and clients. So I have two questions. I'm only going to ask you one at start, and we'll see if you jump the gun uh, on the second one. But the first one is, okay, so you got, this is an example, you got Patty, she's a psychologist in, in say, Pennsylvania. And she wants to talk about herself, but she also talks about three specific clients. Now there's 7 billion people on the planet. I'd like to know, how do you find those three clients in order to have the conversation? We connect with Patty as we are talking to her. We move into her energy. And when she moves into saying talk about, let's say, Peter, who she wants to help, but she feels that you know there's an energy block and she'd like to know what that energy block is so that she can maneuver around it, we move through her energy. We ask the first name of Peter, and we move through her energy into this Peter. Now, we don't have any information about Peter other than what's going on with him energetically. We look for the blockage that she's asked about. We find it, we retrieve it, and we talk to her about the parameters of that that are going on in this particular individual's life. This helps Patty greatly because now she is able to ask the right questions, ask the Peter certain moments about what he's going through so that she can help him. And we do this often, because every one of you is an energy, and we move through the energy of those who are asking so they can be helpful um, to create an atmosphere for them of healing. Now, we can't just move into somebody randomly. Let's say, you know, Mary Jo calls up and wants to know what somebody's thinking or doing. We can't just move into somebody's energy without permission. But if it is a professional healer, then we do. But it's only to find the blockages and to find the energy so that they can be helped. Okay, Veronica, now I have a follow-up question. I hope that uh, our listeners will cut me a break because I tend to be more scientific and... uh, well, let's just say scientific and stuff that people couldn't care less about. But I'd like to know more specifically how you do it. Specifically, when you move into somebody's energy, do you see a movie? Do you just know what happens? Do you talk to the spirit guides? I mean, how do you do it? Well, you forget that we are energy ourselves. We are using the form of the April Crawford, but we have no solid moment in this particular reality. We are like an electromagnetic current. And all of you are based in electromagnetics. Um, you have a biology, yes, but you're both, all, most of you are electromagnetic in your perceptions. When we talk to, say, Patty, we are connecting with her. We're moving into her energy. And it's not like a movie. It is more about frequency. And she says, okay, I want to, talk, I want to know how I can help Peter get past this particular blockage and can you identify it? By moving our current, our electromagnetics, through Patty and into, we can find the blockage. It's not a movie. It's not solid. It isn't a projection. It is the electromagnetic energy that is pulsing within Peter that we become part of that allows us to move into his energy enough so that we can see where the blockage is. Then we lift up and out and we move back into Patty 
and continue our conversation with Patty. And we have the ability to indicate to her what we have seen. Now, it's not seen with the eyes. It's not a picture. It's an energy current. Okay, Veronica. Now, before we move into your final, your message for the world, which is a, a part of this show, um, I know everybody in the world would really like to hear uh, the tuba band that I have outside to play um pa pa music, but I'm not going to do that. Why? Because <laughs> Veronica will, will not be pleased. So I'm going to hand the phone to Veronica for her message to you and to the world. Being in physical reality at this time is challenging. There are a lot of co-created events occurring that can be disturbing to those who are sensitive and can be disturbing to those who are not sensitive because the energy of it is very thick and dense. We would say it's important for all of you, though, to take a look at what is good in your life. There's a lot of bad stuff circling around. But if you stop for a moment, separate from that and say, where is a good thing in my life? Now, we have some who say, oh, there's nothing good in my life. And we say, well, perhaps look a little deeper. Find one thing every day to be pleased about, to be happy about, to be grateful about, and to have appreciation for. By focusing on the one good thing that happened today, you are allowing your consciousness, your energy, your thoughts to go to that and reside there. And that will help you as a consciousness create more of those things. It's very easy to focus upon all the negative. And unfortunately in your culture, it's pretty much thrown at you every day. You're pelted with it every day. We'd say back up from some of that and decide that you're going to be positive and not get caught up in that vortex of, oh, you know, the world is falling apart. Oh, there's all these terrible things happening. We agree they're happening. But to alleviate that and to turn that around, all of you can't get sucked into the collective of, oh, my God, this is terrible. Each of you individually need to stand strong, back up and say, okay, I'm going to find one thing in my life today that went well, and I'm going to keep my focus there. Because that's going to help the big collective. If everybody does it, that, that helps the big collective. And we don't think there would be any of you that would argue that things need to be different. That moving into all this negativity has to stop. You are powerful enough as an individual to do that. So we'd say don't feel that you're diminished. Or, okay, well, I'm just one person. How could that be? If each one of you decided, hey, we, I'm going to be more positive today and I'm going to focus and find one good thing that happened today and that's where I'm going to let my energy sit for the rest of the day. It will help you personally and it will help you as a collective of energy on the planet. This is a time of great growth. This is a time of great change. And there are a lot of negative things that do need to change. But you can't change them if you're going to get all negative with it. You have to decide that you're not going to. That you're going to say, all right, that, that was a pretty terrible thing. But I'm going to take the one thing that I found today and place it in front of me as a beacon of light to everyone else that there is hope, the probability of a return to Eden is what we call it, where you go back to this magical place of peacefulness. It can happen. But if you let yourself become part of the collective negative thought process, it won't. So every day, the responsibility is upon you as an individual. Even if you've had a lousy day, you find the one thing and say, this is what I'm going to designate energetically to this day, and it's positive. Because if each of you do that, regardless of the fact of what's going on otherwise, you will be of help. We have many ask us, how can we, how can we be of service? How can we fix this? How, what can we do? We say remain positive and find those positive moments in your day and put them up as your badge of honor and allow that energy to shine out to everyone else in a positive way. This is a time of great change. Careful 
not to slide into the negative perspective of the cleanup. You want to create an atmosphere of peace. And that means you have to find the peace within you at an event in your day that was peaceful. That will help create the atmosphere that we know all of you are looking for. Thank you, Veronica. And this (laughs) concludes the interesting part of this fifth broadcast and podcast. I would just like to mention as Alan that I'd like to see more comments come in uh, because a lot of them are good and we can use some of the questions in future episodes. Comments, questions, they're welcome. And thank you very much and we can't wait to hear you and your comments for episode six upcoming.